Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for coming out tonight. And for those who might be uh, viewing this online or uh, looking at this Bible lecture a little later on, the Christadelphians are Bible students, and Ezekiel 38 is of particular interest to us. You'll notice in our reading tonight, in verse 8, it says that after many days thou shalt be visited, and this is speaking to the aggressor mentioned in this chapter. In the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel which have been always waste but is brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. Now there's a couple of things to note here. First of all, this prophecy is about two and a half thousand years old. So the prophets predicting a number of things, that the nation would be scattered by the sword and then at some time when they'd be reconstituted a nation in the land of Israel, which happens to be 1948, then further down the track, the aggressor in this chapter is also going to come against them. Now that's remarkable because as a teenager, I knew nothing about the Bible. But when I started to look at the word of God in my teens, I stopped to think at the tender age of 15, how did the prophets of the Old Testament know so much about what's happening in our day? And it's because they're inspired by Almighty God himself, who, is, as we've heard in our prayer, is the great creator of the whole world. He knows the beginning from the end. Now tonight, ladies and gentlemen, with our full title being 10 years of Russian aggression, what is God's plan for world peace? We do want to say that our lecture isn't politically motivated. We're not here to bag anyone of Russian origin either. It's not an attack on the Russian people. Um, in fact, many of the Russians today would be mourning the loss of uh, Mr Navalny, who only nine days ago passed away in a Russian prison. So what's causing a lot of the tension in our world today? Well, not only is there tension in the Middle East, but much of the tension in Europe and in Russia revolves around NATO membership, doesn't it? It revolves around that. How many countries are signing up? There's angst in Russia to some degree, particularly politically, about the membership of NATO. Now, the last 10 years, let's focus on that just for a moment here. So much of what we're looking at tonight, we've just highlighted there, much of the history of Russian aggression has been around the Ukraine. But we're not going to focus so much on this hour. I noticed on the board driving in, the focus is on God's plan for peace. And um, even though we perhaps might spend less time on that tonight than the actual uh, history of Russia, we're going to start with God's plan of peace because that's the important bit. And we're going to finish with that as well tonight. So I just want to do two slides now on God's plan because all things in perspective in such a troubled world, it is God's plan that is most important. Now, this is what our Lord Jesus Christ taught his disciples to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now that's critical. The Christadelphians firmly believe that the Bible teaches from cover to cover that God has a purpose with this earth. The meek will inherit the earth, Jesus said. And we're to pray for God's kingdom to come and God's will to be done upon this earth as God dwells in heaven with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, at his right hand. And there's the angels in heaven as well, and they all do the will of God. So we desire that God's will might be done upon the earth just the same. So Almighty God has a plan with the earth 
And Jesus Christ taught his disciples and he's taught us to pray for that kingdom to come. Now let's also go to the Old Testament scriptures because the Old and the New agree. Now Psalm 22 is of particular interest to students of the Bible because it prophesies concerning some of the critical moments around the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. But at the end of the chapter, we get the big picture. We get the big picture of God's plan. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord and all the kindreds of the nation shall worship before thee. This is almighty God's big picture. For the kingdom, the psalm says, this is psalm of David, the prophet, the kingdom is Yahweh's and he is the governor among the nations. So almighty God's in control. He is the governor among the nations. Almighty God rules in the present kingdom of men. But quite literally, when the kingdom of God is established, the Lord will be the governor among the nations. So we want to show from the outset that there is great hope within the word of God. But Almighty God doesn't shy away from telling us about the troubled times as well. And we're going to outline now some of the things which have happened in the last 10 years. February 4, 2022, the world watched as Russia invaded its neighbouring country, Ukraine. It's only two years and one day ago. And after much speculation and denial on the part of Russia, Ukraine began to be invaded. What we want to do tonight, though, is not just go back two years. We want to go back the full 10 years, a whole decade. Now, some of these things, when I researched them, I didn't even know. So I'd never heard of the uh, particular square mentioned here. If you can read that from back there, um, some of the protests in Ukraine, um, in Euromaiden, which is actually a square, and I, I presume that the picture there has something to do with the naming of the square. But the then president of Ukraine, Viktor Yunukovych, who you may remember, was not only very close to President Putin, who came back into power, you might remember, after a short four years where President Medvedev uh, was the president in Russia, Putin came back into power in 2012. So a couple of years later, you've got this strong relationship building between the president of Ukraine, uh, President U Yunukovych, and President Putin, but unfortunately, the president of Ukraine sacrificed many of his own people, 130, I think it says, in one day, um, in one protest. And if you do your research on the number of protests, not only in Euro Maiden Square, but in other areas of Ukraine, there were many, many dozens of people in Ukraine who lost their lives to the then president because of his political leanings. So where to from there? Well, February, March, 10 years ago, Russia suddenly seized the Crimean region. There was little resistance compared to the current war which we see in Ukraine over the last two years. And we're going to show on the map where Crimea is um, it's a long way away from Australia, and unless you have a particular interest in following current events or Bible prophecy or both, you may not be familiar. So the area that we have in amber, showing up as amber on my screen, down the bottom is the area of Crimea, and it's a bit, a little bit difficult to interpret because they've put the land in a bluey purple colour, but the white's the sea, and you can see that Crimea is almost an island. Not quite, it's a peninsula. It's almost an island down the south there. It was an easy target with a bridge actually going over from uh, Russia to Crimea. And that was taken with little resistance 10 years ago. Only five years ago, a much younger and fresher uh, Vladimir Zelensky 
uh, came into power in Ukraine. And that was on the back of, of course, some of the things which uh, President Yunukovych had managed to achieve, including, of course, a lot of opposition from uh, people within his own country, especially the relatives of those who were uh, deceased in the, in the protests. So about five years ago, Zelensky became president of Ukraine. And of course, for the last two years, he would have aged greatly. He's been working tirelessly to combat what to, appears still to be an inevitable Russian takeover. Don't know that for sure, but many believe that it is inevitable. Early in 2021, prior to the Russian invasion, um, Zelensky actually cracked down on, you can see highlighted in the yellow there, he cracked down on Russian-Ukrainian oligarchs, you see at the top there. And with this, of course, tensions between Ukraine and Russia rose. And it was then that we started to see the build-up of Russian forces along the Ukrainian border. That's when questions were starting to be asked by the West. Uh, are you coming in to uh, invade? Of course, there were many, many um, denials. February 21, 2022, Russia recognised breakaway Ukrainian regions as sovereign. And you can see, we saw them on the uh, map a moment ago. We'll go back to that map. So besides Crimea, the areas that we just saw highlighted in amber up above, they break away from Ukraine with the blessing of Russia, and we'll show that map just briefly again. So in the Donbass region, which was generally and is generally pro-Russian, uh, the two states there of Luhansk and Donetsk um, broke away from Ukraine. And they were recognised, as we see in highlight in the yellow, as independent states by Russia. Now, February 24th, two years and one day ago, just days after recognising those breakaway states, Russia formally recognised these two independent states. And we start to see here how the map's beginning to change in that region with the um, shaded areas. And you see Crimea down the bottom there. Of course, that goes back 10 years. And you see how Russia's creeping in from the east and starting to take uh, some of that area of Ukraine there in eastern, eastern Ukraine. And conveniently, on October the 5th, 2022, um, which is what, just uh, 16 months ago, four regions were signed over to Russia and we can see the growing takeover trend happening there in Ukraine. Now in retaliation, three days later, that bridge which we mentioned earlier, which is on the um, eastern end of Crimea, was attacked um, almost certainly by Ukrainian forces. Um, it wasn't actually disabled, but it was quite severely damaged and uh, made it difficult for the, for the Russians to get across to, to that area. So we can see um, the tension rising greatly. In June 23rd, uh, we see that the Russian mercenary groups stage a mutiny attempt so the then Ukrainian war, which we've been seeing, is going on and on for you know, over 700 days now. It took an unusual twist, didn't it, as the mercenaries hired by Russia turned against their employer and actually began starting to march towards Moscow. And many of the Muscovites were actually quite alarmed. They weren't ready for any attack on Moscow as such, and it looked like at the time the mercenaries were going to keep going, but it only lasted for one day. Um, the march was short-lived, and some suggest that it was really only um, Prigozhin, Evgeny Prigozhin, sending a message uh, for his demands from President Putin um, and his party to be taken seriously. So it was quite a, 
quite provocative really by the mercenaries to, to do that and I think we all know the outcome a couple of months later. We um, see the headlines in our papers that the mercenary leader Progrosin confirmed dead in a plane crash. And of course um, in the Russian newspapers it was uh, purported that it was you know, an accident. So it was an accidental, accidental death, apparently. As was the death of Alexei Navalny only nine days later. So whether he died accidentally in prison or not, we know that he once upon a time had a cup of tea. He probably wished he never drank. Um, and frankly, you're not safe if you oppose the Putin and, and his government in Russia, but it's a proven fact that you're not safe anywhere in the world if uh, you are marked out um, as being an opponent of President Putin. At the tender age of 47, he's gone and many of the Russians are mourning him. And I don't know about you, but most of us, most of us are blessed with pretty good health up until and including the age of 47. I'd have to wind the clock back a little bit to uh, remember how I felt then, but I think I felt pretty good at 47. Most of us, I think, are blessed with reasonably good health at that age. So another accidental death. You can make your own judgments on that. Well, Let's move into our chapter tonight, Ezekiel chapter 38. We're here to look at the word of God and to give you the interpretation of this marvellous prophecy. As we said some 2,000 years ago, and we've given the breakup of the chapter there for those who are the note takers. I might go through this a little quickly, so I can always pop it back up on the screen afterwards. So... Verses 1 to 7, we have the identity of nations allied with Russia. And you might say, well, hang on, I didn't read Russia there, but we'll go through that in a moment. Verses 8 to 12, a plan to attack the restored nation of Israel. We did comment on that briefly, didn't we, in our introduction tonight. We've got the nation of Israel restored in their land. Uh, they were booted out by the, by the Romans nearly 2,000 years earlier. But this prophecy demands a nation of Israel back in their own land in the last days. And we've got that. We've got that evidence since 1948. That's how accurate Bible prophecy is. Then in verse 13, one standalone verse, we have the feeble cry of opposing allied nations. And we'll see who they are. Verses 14 to 16 the aggressor's origins and when he will move, says in the latter days, verse 16, verse 17 to 21, how God will subdue the enemy. So five clear sections in this particular prophecy. Now, what's the purpose of prophecy? We're just going to stop for a moment, take a breath and see what the Apostle Paul says in the New Testament about what is the purpose of of prophecy and he says whatsoever things are written were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope the purpose of prophecy is not to instill fear in us the purpose of prophecy for the bible student is to give us hope because god has a plan for peace upon this earth it's to give us hope so let's just keep that in the back of our minds as we're going through ezekiel 38 it's not to give us fear it's to give us hope so ezekiel 38 verse 2 who is this gog spoken of here it means a roof and haman gog mentioned in ezekiel 39 the next chapter means the multitude on the roof in the definition of the meaning of the name Above, it's accepted that Gog is a title representative of the one at the top. Now, we're not saying that President Putin is the Gog, but one thing is for certain, the position, the position of the presidency of Russia now is an extremely strong position. I think you'd all agree with that. 
It's an extremely strong position. Maybe it will be someone who will inherit that position from him. The mega guy, uh, identified by Josephus with the Scythians, who, according to Herodotus, spread from the river Tanae or Don westward along the banks of the Istra or Danube. Now, some of this is a little bit technical, I suppose, but we'll show in a few moments that Christadelphian teaching has been consistent for quite a long time in the interpretation of these things. The uh, genuine Diodorus Siculus traces the Scythians or Magogites, Magogites much further into Europe than the Danube, even to the shores of the Baltic. The land of Mago therefore comprises central Europe, including Germany, but extending all the way to the Baltic. And that's from Ezekiel's prof prophecy of the restoration. Now this bit's quite interesting because when we come to verse 2, it says that the prophecy is against the chief prince, which in most other translations is the prince of Rosh. So it's agreed that Rosh is actually a proper noun or proper name. It's a proper noun of a northern nation mentioned with Tubal and Meshach and Gesenia says undoubtedly the Russians who are mentioned by the Byzantine writers of the 10th century. So this is not a new name. Now I'm not sure how many of you did uh, history at school. I did history so I must have been one of those boring students who chose history for some unknown reason. And I quite clearly remember, so this is before I was ever a Bible student, I clearly remember when we came to European and Russian history, reading of the word Ross and Rosh in our history books right here in Australia. So um, our Australian history books at the time, I won't say how many years ago, actually did identify Russia by their ancient name, to which the Bible agrees, or should I say, our historians agree with the Bible. So we can easily identify Rosh with Russia. I'd like to quote to you from El Israel, which was written by John Thomas. And in his uh, preface, the author's preface, January 1, 1850, so not 1950, 1850, he says, the future movements of Russia are notable signs of the times. So this is about 175 years ago he wrote this. The future movements of Russia are notable signs of the times because they are predicted in the scriptures of truth. The Russian autocracy in its plenitude and on the verge of dissolution is the image of Nebuchadnezzar standing upon, note this, the mountains of Israel. He's talking about a Russian invasion in Israel, ready to be smitten by the stone, that is the stone of Daniel chapter 2. When Russia makes its grand move for the building up of its image empire, then let the reader know that the end of all things as at present constituted is at hand. The long expected but stealthy advent of the King of Israel, that's Jesus Christ, will be on the eve of becoming a fact and salvation will be to those who not only look for it but have trimmed their lamps by believing the gospel of the kingdom unto the obedience of faith and the perfection thereof in fruits meet for repentance. So 174 years ago, John Thomas wrote in his preface, and we could go further on, we actually quote the latter end of Elpis Israel in our slide shortly. He wrote about this very subject all those years ago and Christadelphian teaching stands firm in that regard. You might be interested to note that at the beginning of that paragraph it says, a copy of this work has been ordered for presentation to the autocrat, autocrat of all the Russians. Russians. So um, he will receive that copy apparently. I wonder how it would go down if we send a copy to the autocrat of Russia today. Just a thought. Well, verse 2, we go on. And we see now that uh, Ross is Russia. What about Meshach and Tubal? Meshach speaks of the Muscovites. And in 
Uh, the bottom paragraph there, the River Tobol, the name is linked with Tobolium or Tobolsky, the metropolis of the extensive region of Siberia. And that is actually taken from page 425 of the same book. If you want to come up and check that with me, uh, the information's in Elpis Israel, which means the hope of Israel on that page. Now, if we just jump some verses to verse 15, just for a moment, we'll come there later. In verse 15, if you've got any doubt, you mind, is this Russia? Is it really Moscow? Is it the region of Siberia, Tobolsky? Well, verse 15, the prophet Ezekiel says, Thou shalt come from thy place out of the north part. So let's see where this is in relation to Israel and Jerusalem. So we've got the uh, world map there. And we just highlight in red Jerusalem down the bottom, Moscow up the top, and you can see that the arrow that I've placed in there is almost perfectly at 90 degrees to the writing on the map. Doesn't get much more due north than that, does it? So Moscow is virtually due north of Jerusalem. So this power is coming out of the north parts, says Ezekiel, and is absolutely spot on. Well, what about some of the other nations mentioned in this chapter? We've got Goma, identified with the Gauls who settled in the region of France and the surrounding small European countries. So, um, Tagama, the next nation mentioned, verse 6, refers to Turkey, an area which must be controlled by Russia in the time of their move south. What we don't know from the description in Ezekiel is whether Turkey will throw in their lot voluntarily or whether they'll be taken over. Some of this detail doesn't actually appear right here, but we can also go to the prophet Daniel um, for further information because in Daniel 11, uh, the king of the north is another title which is given in this case to Russia who will come down into the region of Turkey in the last days. We're not going to Daniel 11 tonight, but certainly take a note of that. Now, where is a lot of this anti-Israel feeling coming from? That's, that's really, all we, today it's pretty obvious, there's plenty of anti-Israel feeling, isn't there? Plenty of protests um, in support of the Palestinians, and yet it's quite remarkable, if I was to say to you, when the Lord Jesus Christ trod on the earth 2,000 years ago, there were no Palestinians in the land. So who's really occupying the territory? Just a thought. Who is really occupying the territory? Because the media uses terms like Jewish settlers and so forth. It was the Jews' land in the days of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. Sure, the Romans held sway over them, but there were no Palestinians then. But just some food for thought, who really are the occupiers? Where did the Palestinians come from? Maybe that's a question that could be answered in another lecture. It's not our title for tonight, but there's plenty of anti-Semitic feeling in the world today. But it's been there, underlying, in Russia and in European regions for a long time, as we know. So. In seeking explanations for uh, modern, anti uh, modern anti-Semitism, historians, of course, have looked to um, Germany. Now, the Habsburg Empire mentioned there was a multinational empire in Central Europe under the rule of the Habsburg dynasty. Be careful if you Google that one, because you might get Habsburg come up quite a lot. This is Habsburg with a P. This was from 1273 until 1918. And from 1867, it was known as the Austro-Hungary uh, area. Its nucleus was Austrian, included at different times countries. Now, note this, with considerable Jewish populations. Now, the read actually is quite heavy, but the Habsburgs, whilst on the one hand... Uh, showing the Jews many favours because they had much of the financial control, also placed many, many restrictions on them which most of the citizens didn't have to observe. And of course, if you do your history on that, you'll see that the underlying 
uh, anti-Semitism was there for centuries and centuries of time. But they couldn't get rid of the Jews. They actually needed them in society, but they didn't want them in society, if you like. And the same author, Sam Johnson, also notes that what has been underplayed is anti-Semitism over in the East. There's been a lot of study on anti-Semitism in, in Europe, but the role played by the Tsarist Empire, which went for 370 years from 1547, so do your maths there, um, the darkest backward Russia has frequently, says Mr Johnson, been overlooked or underplayed. There's been much anti-Semitism um, there in the East as well. And we have actually got for you tonight a report, it's only six years ago, a report on anti-Semitism in Russia, 2018, and I'd like to read for you the section, it's quite a long document, this one here, as is the history of the conflict of Russia against Ukraine, that one's 38 pages, so if you want to read some heavy reading, go to the House of Commons Library and you can do your 10 years history, or you can read the whole report here. But I'm going to read to you just one paragraph from this 2018 report, and we're going to put that red section on one slide. The most high profile of those was the incident in September where Vladimir Zirinovsky initiated a heated exchange with Alexander Kinstein on the TV show called Evening with Vladimir. That is Vladimir Solovyov, and I think I've got that right. Now, in the heat of the debate, Zirinovsky said to Kinstein, you are a Jew, go to, so go to Israel, and we are Russians. And he probably encapsulates some of the feeling in Russia today. Now, what you might not know is that Zirinovsky, A, he's passed away now, actually, if you do your research. He passed away a couple of years ago, April the 6th, 2022. But... Uh, Vladimir Zirinovsky was the author, and those of us who are older may remember this book, he was the author of the book which was called The Last Thrust South. The Last Thrust South, and in his ideology as the leader of the Russian De uh, Liberal Democratic Party from 1992 until his death, he was the leader for about 30 years, and he was once considered presidential material, he actually postulated about the possibility of Russia moving down into the Middle East, including Israel, and he called his book The Last Thrust South. And that perhaps, that one paragraph perhaps encapsulates some of the anti-Semitism that's alive and well in Russia. Nearly 20 years ago, about 20 years ago, it was estimated that Russia had some 55,000 skinheads who identified as Nazis. That's 20 years ago. So anti-Semitism is alive and well in Russia. Okay, now we had the feeble cry in verse 13. Now we're not going to go through every verse, verse by verse, but we've got Russia, we've got some of the nations with them as well, including verse 5, Persia, which we know as Iran, Ethiopia and Libya with them, Goma, the house of Tagama. They come down against the mountains of Israel and there's a feeble cry, verse 13, Sheba, Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lions thereof shall say... You always, almost hear the quiver in their voice. Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou come to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Who are they? What's the great spoil? Well, we know how much wealth, of course, that the Israelis have worldwide. They are a very rich people. They've been very wise with their coin, so to speak. There was one council area here in Australia who, protesting against the Jewish settlers in occupied territories and the treatment of Palestinians some years ago, decided in their wisdom 
to boycott anything from Israel. And someone quickly reminded them that all their computers would go down because of the programs, etc., that they, they use. So you'll have to go back to paper and pen in your council. You won't be able to turn on a computer and use it if you want to boycott Israel. Well, we've got a feeble cry here from Tarshish and the Young Lions. And without going into the history of Tarshish and the tin traders, which would take quite some time, you can definitely, uh, you can definitely link Tarshish back with the area of Cornwall uh, from whence the tin came, and we get our word Tarshish from that. But the nation that put out the World War II posters with themselves as a lion, with a great call for the young lions to come and help, was Britain themselves. And of course, New Zealand, Australia and Canada, South Africa, were some of the young lions depicted in other posters similar to this around World War II. There's little doubt that Tarshish and the young lions are indeed Britain and the Commonwealth nations, but they won't have the strength. They'll have the strength to raise their voice and question but they won't have the strength to resist the move of Russia and the allies of Russia in that day. With them, they've got Sheba and Dedan, areas down in the Saudi Peninsula, but they're very feeble against the might of Russia with their allies. Now, as we said, we come to verse 15 again. They're out of the north parts now. On the world map, Israel looks so tiny. It's that little red section there, little red section there which is at the centre of the earth. I remember turning on my radio one morning and the, just as the commentator said, and now to the centre of the earth, and I thought, whoa, I've got to listen to this. I wonder if that's Israel. And it was, it was a report in Israel. And... I thought, I wonder if it says that anywhere in the Bible, that Jerusalem is the centre of the earth. It is the bridgehead of three continents, isn't it? It's the bridgehead of three continents. And there's only one place where I can find that Jerusalem and Israel is the centre of the earth. And it's Ezekiel 5, verse 5. It's easy to remember. Look it up in your own time. This is Jerusalem. I have set her, says Almighty God, I have set her in the midst of the nations. It's in the middle. It's the centre of the earth, Jerusalem. It's the bridgehead of the continents of the nations. And that's got something to do with God's plan for world peace, we'll see. It's not the centre of the earth for nothing. And Russia's coming down there for a spoil and a prey. Is it the Leviathan gas fields? We don't really know. We don't know why they're coming down exactly what the spoil is. And it's probably not that important. But they're coming down for a spoil and a prey. And God's going to put hooks in their jaws and almost force them to come down. They're going to come down and they're going to come not only against Israel, but Daniel 11 says that Egypt is not going to escape as well. So Egypt's going to be a target. So they're going to come out of the north parts. We've shown that uh, map once more before. When we take a close-up of here, we can see it's due north. Now, at the end of this chapter, the section which we have um, coming down after uh, God describes them coming from the north parts with horses, a great company and a mighty army. Now, of course, Ezekiel's speaking of conventional warfare as it was in his day but um, I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards about whether there'll be conventional war when Russia actually comes down or not because the nations today do have the capacity to take out each other's satellites and if we know the repercussions for our banking system for our communication for using Siri to get from A to B, for the use of drones in battle if we don't have any satellites. Ezekiel's description of conventional warfare might actually be way more closer than what we might think. But here we are. Once Russia comes down, Almighty God 
is going to intervene. In verse 17, it says, Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have sp spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophets in, prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken, surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. So that the fishes of the sea, the fowls of the heaven, and the beasts of the field and all the creeping things that creep on the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountain shall be thrown down and the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground. Now Ezekiel says, I've spoken about you in old time by my servants, the prophets. Now I'm going to put something to, to you, ladies and gentlemen. I haven't really read of Rosh before Ezekiel here. So who, is, who are the prophets who have spoken about Russia beforehand? Well, in the book of Revelation, Egypt is used to spiritually describe the condition of Rome. Egypt is spiritually used to describe Rome. Edom is used in the Old Testament prophets to describe all of the non-Jewish peoples, Gentiles. And I'm going to submit to you that the writings by the prophets who faithfully wrote down God's word, when they wrote about the nation of Assyria, we're not going to prove it tonight, but when they wrote about the nation and the destruction, I might add, of Assyria, who came down from the north into the land of Israel and were destroyed in one night... 185,000 of them, I'm going to submit to you that when Ezekiel says, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets, that he's saying, if you want to know more about Rosh, if you want to know more about the movements of Gog, have a look in the Bible at what Assyria did and how God dealt with them then you'll know what's going to happen to Gog and to his army, OK? Now, most of us know about some of the carols and so forth that are sung at Christmas time. They sing about Jesus born to be king and all this sort of thing. But you know what? He is born to be king and he is coming again. And the description given in this chapter here of the judgments of Almighty God are not going to be done by Almighty God himself, but by Jesus Christ who will return to the earth and the angels who will come with him. But at the birth of Christ, at the birth of Christ, the prophet, the one prophet who spoke about his birth told us about the mission of Jesus Christ as well. And this is the mission of Jesus Christ who was born to be king. You can turn this up in Micah in your own time. We've only taken a couple of verses, but read the whole lot yourself. There's about four verses there from two to five. Thou Bethlehem, Ephratah, out of thee shall come forth unto me he that is to be ruler in Israel. Now, there's no real dispute who that's talking about because every Christian in the world knows that this is a prophecy of Jesus Christ and his birth. He was born in Bethlehem. People go there on pilgrimages. I want, I want, they want to see Bethlehem. But go down a few verses to verse 5, and it's not talking about the baby Jesus anymore. It's talking about Jesus Christ and his mission when he comes to the earth again. And Micah says, this man, not this baby, this man, this man shall be the peace. He'll be the one who makes peace. When the Assyrian shall come into the land and when he shall tread in our palaces, then we shall raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. There will be the Lord Jesus Christ 
and there will be righteous rulers with him. The 15 are probably made up out of the 12 apostles and a few other people. There'll be 15 others with him who will be raised up to shepherd the people and he'll be the peace. But first, he has to defeat the Assyrian. He has to defeat the one who comes down into the land of Israel in the latter days. And that gives to us hope, doesn't it, ladies and gentlemen? It gives to us hope because Jesus Christ not only taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, but the angel Gabriel promised Mary, the Lord's mother, that he was born to be king. And that's what it says in Luke chapter 1. The angel said to Mary, thou hast found favour with God, and behold, you are going to conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, Jesus. He's going to be great. He's going to be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. Where was the throne of David? It was in Jerusalem. So Jesus Christ is going to inherit that throne. Same place, maybe even the same throne. You can't be sure. Might be the exact same throne. He's going to reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. It's going to be an everlasting kingdom. He's going to reign over the house of Jacob. Now Jacob's used almost interchangeably in the Bible with Israel. He's going to reign over the house of Israel forever and there's going to be no end of his kingdom. And you might be listening and thinking, well, that's all very well for Israel. But what about the rest of the world? The rest of the world needs hope too, not just, not the, not just the little nation of Israel. What's the rest of the world going to do? Well, the prophet Isaiah says, and you'll notice we've mixed, we're giving you a mix of Old and New Testament tonight so you get a taste of the whole of the Bible. He says, unto us a child is born. Here's another prophecy of the birth of Jesus Christ. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. There's five titles there of Jesus Christ. And that doesn't discount the great creator who is the Almighty God. Just because he's called the Father in Scripture doesn't mean to say that the Lord Jesus Christ can't be described as a God and a Father as well, because he will be the king of the whole world. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. There will be no end of his government upon the throne of David. Notice that, agrees with the promise of Gabriel to Mary. It's on the throne of David in Jerusalem and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it it with justice and judgment from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And you're probably going to say, well, that still doesn't mention the whole world. So let's go to Isaiah 2. We'll get there. Isaiah chapter 2. We'll go back a few pages in Isaiah, and Isaiah tells us the wonderful picture of every nation benefiting from God's plan for world world peace. It will come to pass in the last days, says Isaiah, in the last days, just like the latter days in Ezekiel 38, in the last days, just when things look hopeless, when people's hearts are failing them for fear, for everything that's coming upon the earth, when everything's looking hopeless in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. It shall be exalted above the hills, yes, in Jerusalem, but it's not just Israel that's going to flow up there. Isaiah says, all nations shall flow unto it. And many people will voluntarily say, come ye, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord's house to the house of the God of Jacob and he will teach us of his ways and we will voluntarily walk in his path because out of Zion at Jerusalem, because that's what Isaiah 30 says, Zion's at Jerusalem, 
Out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So it's an international hope, ladies and gentlemen. It's not just a hope for Israel. Jesus Christ is coming to bring the judgments on the latter-day Assyrian. Micah says he was born to do that work. He was born to do that work and to bring peace upon this terrible world that so much needs the coming of God's Son. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to consider looking into the Word of God because this is the book from the Almighty that gives each of us hope. This is the book. And we learn from Peter, the Apostle Peter, in Acts chapter 3, the advice for each of us to repent, for us individually to be converted, that our sins may be blotted out, because there's times of refreshing which are going to come from the presence of the Almighty. Why? Because he's going to send his son Jesus Christ back to the earth. He's going to send him from heaven until the times of restitution or restoration, that word means, the time of restoration of all things. There's a lot of restoration needs to happen in the Holy Land at the moment. There's a lot of restoration needs to happen in the whole world at the moment. And God's spoken about these things by the mouth of all his holy prophets, including Ezekiel, since the world began. Thank you.